stream because this is a room within a being said we're gonna get started with our show in just a couple more minutes thanks for waiting y'all All righty, everybody. I just got the okay to start our planetarium show. So I'm going to put away our space trivia questions because now we're going to be heading into the unknown. Ooh. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and uh, once again, everybody, welcome, welcome to the Morrison Planetarium. Really quickly, I just want to introduce myself. My name is Christian. I want to be your planetarium presenter. And uh, heads up, I'm not just a voice coming out of the walls. I'm actually a person and I'm standing right behind you. Hey, how's it going, everybody? <laughs> Don't hurt your necks. Look forward into the dome before you. That's where the whole show is going to be. Everything that you see in purple is going to be one enormous screen, thanks to the help of six different projectors hiding throughout our planetarium dome. And uh, just to let you know, folks, the show that we're going to be doing right now is by far my favorite to do here in the Morrison Planetarium. This is a little show called Tour of the Universe. And with Tour of the Universe, uh, this show is about 30 minutes long, and you're going to hear my voice for the next 30 minutes. And... Uh, what we're going to be doing is that we're going to be starting off pretty close to Earth, and we're going to zoom all the way out to the very edge of the observable universe. Hopefully by the end of the show, you won't have an existential crisis of where we are in space. But just a heads up, we are very small in the grand scheme of things, so just to pre-warn you. But before we get started with our show, folks, I do got to go over some quick house rules just so that we're all on the same page. We have a great experience in the planetarium. There's quite a few of us in here right now. First off, there's no food or drinks allowed inside, so if you manage to bring any snacks or beverages, make sure those are put away to the very end of the show. We want to keep the theater nice and clean for all the guests coming in, in the future. Um, also, if you happen to have any 21st century gadgets like cell phones, smartwatches, tablets, anything that produces bright white light or loud sound, now is the perfect time to turn them off, deactivate them, put away for the next 30 minutes, as these are not only distracting for you, but for the folks sitting behind you. So we want to be courteous to everyone in the planetarium dome. And also, folks, the biggest of them all, please, please remember to wear your mask at all times while we're in the planetarium. People tend to forget that we breathe out of our nostrils, so make sure those nostrils are covered up. It looks like there's about, ooh, 120 of us here in the planetarium dome right now, so uh, we're going to be here for the next 30 minutes. We're all breathing, we're all exhaling, so remember, please wear those masks. Can't stress that enough. And also, folks, if you do need to exit the planetarium for any reason, you're more than welcome to do so. All we ask is that you exit at the very top of the planetarium. That's where the exits are going to be before, during, and after the show. So when in doubt, always make your way up the stairs. Although if you're a person that has trouble climbing with the stairs, which is totally understandable, the stairs are very steep, just wait until the show's over. We'll have some staff members escort you to a lower exit, but that's once the show is over. So stay tuned for that. And last but not least, folks, this show is very immersive thanks to our 70-foot dome above us. If at any point during the show you start to feel overwhelmed, you start to experience motion sensitivity, there's a really quick and easy way to ground yourself. All you got to do is close your eyes, take a few big deep breaths, and your brain will remember that you're sitting in a planetarium in San Francisco, and not that you're flying through the universe, at least not more than the usual. Hee hee hee. But with that being said, it looks like we're ready to go. So everybody sit back, relax, and let's get started with our tour of the universe. All righty, everybody. As I mentioned, we're going to be starting off pretty close to Earth. But this this doesn't really look like San Francisco. Okay, maybe downtown San Francisco. Okay, just kidding. We're going to be starting off a little bit above our planet. We can see the Earth just down below us. And we're starting off at this thing called the International Space Station, or the ISS for short. 
Now, a lot of people tend to ask me, hey, Christian, what's the International Space Station? I hear about it all the time in the news and articles, but I never, I never really understood it. What is it? Well, to let you know, folks, the International Space Station is a research facility, a laboratory that's orbiting around our planet Earth. And pretty much how we got there, a bunch of nations, countries around our world wanted to figure out what happens to things in space. So they all got together and created this space station where they can conduct different science experiments that they can't normally conduct on Earth. Some of the different science experiments that they'll conduct up here are things like what happens when you try to grow plants in space? Do the plants grow the same? Do they grow differently with less gravity? What happens when you try to spark a, a match of fire in space? Does the flame act the same? Does that act differently? And one of my favorites is where they had two identical twins. One twin lived on Earth for a year. The other one lived on the International Space Station for a year. After that year, they compared and contrasted. Turns out if you live in space for a long period of time, you age a little bit slower. But not only that, you also lose a lot of uh, muscle because you don't have gravity constantly pulling down on your muscles. So if you're going to live in space for a long period of time, remember to exercise every day. And folks, the International Space Station looks huge on our screen right now, but it's not that big in actuality. It's only about the size of an American football field. So if you've never been to an American football game, don't worry. We can also use the entire California Academy of Sciences, the museum that we're sitting in right now. And also, folks, what's really cool about the International Space Station is that this thing is going incredibly fast. It's going to whop in 17,000 miles per hour, where it orbits once around the Earth every 90 minutes where it experiences 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets a day. Whew, how romantic. <laughs> and also, folks, it looks really far away from our planet Earth, but the International Space Station isn't too far away either. It's only about 225 miles above the surface of our Earth. 225 miles, that's like going from San Francisco to Santa Barbara, a nice little road trip to get away for the, with the family for the weekend. But again, this is as far as we put humans into space nowadays, only 225 miles above the surface of our planet because going into space is very, very expensive. You got to get yourself a rocket ship or build yourself a rocket ship, and then you have to account for all the rocket fuel. I mean a lot. You're going to need a lot of rocket fuel. And once you get your hands on all that fuel, you also have to account for all the food, all the water, all the air you're going to be breathing while you're up here in space. So the bill starts to get quite costly quite rapidly. But the International Space Station, folks, is just our first stop on our tour of the universe, so let's slowly leave this behind. It looks like we're flying just above the coast of Chile in South America, so we're going to lose the International Space Station. And before we lose complete track of the International Space Station, I want to add a nice orbital path so we can keep track of it as we zoom away from our Earth. All righty, folks. So now we're looking down at our planet Earth. And to let you know, the space program that I'm using right now, folks, is something that you can go home and download if you like. And if you want to fly through space just like how I am, the space program that I'm using is something called Open Space. So again, the program is called Open Space. But if you want to download it, go to your favorite search engine, type in Open Space Project. You'll find the website there and they can download the program. But just a heads up, folks, this program is not entirely finished. It's in its beta phase. So we may come across a few bugs and glitches here and there. If we do, I'll point them out. Hopefully, we can look past them. And also, folks, this program uses a whole lot of processing power and information. So if you have an older computer, I wouldn't recommend downloading it. Although if you have a newer one or a gaming computer, give it a try. It's a whole lot of fun, open space. But if you're a person like me that doesn't want to download anything, because I don't like downloading stuff, uh, we also have another alternative called NASA's Eyes. So if you type in your favorite search engine, NASA's Eyes, just like the human eyeball, you can also fly through space just like how I am, and it's a whole lot of fun. But let's leave our planet Earth behind, because let's make our way over to our nearest natural neighbor to us in space, the moon. Now, we humans have been to the moon before, but that was quite a while ago. That was between 1969 and 1972, thanks to NASA's six Apollo space missions. That brought a total of 12 incredibly lucky guys to walk on the surface of the moon. They got, they got to conduct science, and of course, they had fun. They got to play some golf up here as well. But again, the last time we sent humans to the moon was 1972, a little more than 50 years ago or so. 
But don't worry, folks. We humans are planning to make a return trip back to the moon in the next few years, thanks to NASA's new space mission called Artemis. Now, pretty much with Artemis, NASA wants to send humans to Mars, but before we send humans deep into our solar system, we need to figure out how exactly we're going to live out here in space. So the moon is a perfect stepping stone to figure out all those logistics. And what's really cool about uh, Artemis is that they're going to be sending the first woman to the moon, but not only that, they're also going to be sending the first person of color to the moon, but not only that, they're also going to be setting up lunar bases throughout the moon. Pretty much our technology has improved in the last 50 years, and we're now able to uh, conduct science much more better than what we did 50 years ago when we first visited the moon. So we're now going to take this opportunity to check out things that we weren't able to check out in the past. So one of the main places we want to go check out is the South Pole of the moon. That looks like a lot of cool stuff down there. Maybe we want to check out the very high mountains uh, of the moon, or maybe we want to go check out some different um, collapsed lava caves that we weren't, we weren't able to check out before. So with all these moons all around, they're also going to have a space station that's going to be orbiting around the moon at all times. And just like kind of, kind of with like the International Space Station that we saw, but this one's going to be called Lunar Gateway. So if anything was to go wrong while these astronauts are on the surface of the moon, they can launch off the surface, head to that space station where they would be safe. So again, we humans should be heading back to the moon in the next few years, thanks to the new space mission, Artemis. So look out for any news about that. And folks, when we look at the moon here on Earth, sometimes the moon feels incredibly close to us, so close that it feels like you can reach out your arms and touch it. But the moon is incredibly far away from us, folks. It's roughly about 240,000 miles away from us. Whew, 240,000 miles. Some of the adults in this room may have a car with that many miles on it. And if you take better care of your car than I do, you can even imagine driving to the moon if you drove for four months nonstop going about 80 miles per hour. Although I wouldn't recommend it, the roads out here are poorly maintained. He he he. And uh, from here on now, folks, we're going to need to use a more useful measuring stick because at this scale, using miles is kind of like using inches to describe the distances between cities. So astronomers use a more convenient measurement known as light speed. And light travels at a mind-boggling speed of 187,000 miles per second. That's roughly about 300,000 kilometers per second. So while it took the astronauts more than three days to reach the moon, traveling faster and farther than any human has done so or since, it only takes light one and a half seconds to cross that distance at the speed of light. That's kind of like a short pause in conversation. But at last, folks, it's time for us to leave the moon behind. So everybody say bye-bye, moon. See you later. He's <laughs> so cute. And on our journey today, folks, we're going to now see the moon and the earth as they slowly disappear. In fact, before we lose our our objects, I want to add a planet trail so we can keep track of that. And on our journey today, folks, we're going to be traveling much faster than the speed of light. We're going to be traveling at the speed of the human imagination, thanks to computer models like Open Space showing us the most accurate images and information available to us. And now the nearest star to us should be coming into the view. So uh, here comes the sun, do 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 do. There it is. <laughs> and folks, the sun is also incredibly far away from us as well from the Earth. So the distance between the Earth and the sun, that's about 93 million miles. So we're the third rock from the sun over here, 93 million miles between us. But in terms of light speed, that's not that far at all. For light to travel that incredibly large distance, it only takes light about eight and a half minutes to cross that distance, so at the speed of light, only eight minutes and a half. But that's a really cool concept to keep in mind because let's say the sun was to turn off all of a sudden, well, we wouldn't know about it here on Earth for eight and a half minutes because that's the last bit of sunlight would be emitted. It would travel that great distance and then finally the daytime would become nighttime. And again, this is such a cool concept because this works for really far away objects as well. For example, let's say we're seeing a star that's 70 light years away from us. Well, we're seeing that star as it looked like 70 years ago because that light traveled that long to reach us. So when we look at really far away objects out into space, it's like looking back in time in a sense. Pretty cool. But now that we have a nice bird's eye perspective of our solar system, let's get a refresher of what's inside of it because there's a lot of cool stuff in our solar system. Right in the middle, we have our star, the sun. The closest planet to the sun, we've got Mercury. Then we have Venus, Earth, that's us. And then we have Mars. These are the rocky terrestrial planets. These are places where we can actually land a spacecraft on. And then past the orbit of Mars, we have this really cool thing called the main asteroid belt. 
And this is what it would look like if you highlight all those asteroids in the asteroid belt. There is a lot of them. There they are. And then past our main asteroid belt, we have the really big planets, our gas giants. We've got Jupiter, Saturn, and then past them, we have our icy gas giants. We've got the funny one, Uranus, and Neptune. And of course, of course, we can always add everyone's favorite and lovable dwarf planet, Pluto. And here's the orbit of Pluto on screen right over there. And a lot of people tend to ask me, hey, Christian, why did Pluto get kicked out of the Planet Club? I learned about it in school. I still think of Pluto as a planet. Viva la Pluto. Well, you see, folks, in 2006, we learned a lot about the outer part of our solar system, specifically the region past the orbit of Neptune. And what did we find past out here? Well, we came across all this stuff called the Kuiper Belt. And you're probably wondering, what's the Kuiper Belt? Well, it's all this stuff. Yeah. So you can kind of think of the Kuiper Belt as a second asteroid belt. It's mostly filled with icy asteroids and short period comets, comets that don't stray too far away from the sun. Nice little short periods. But in 2006, astronomers found more than 400 objects out here in the Kuiper Belt region, and we couldn't call all this stuff planets. There was just way too many of them. So all the astronomers came together, had a great big meeting on Earth, and uh, one of the criteria that you need to be to be considered a planet is that you need to be so big and so massive that you push all the other stuff out of your path. Unfortunately for Pluto, it didn't pass that test. It kind of dances around its own moon, and it also gets pushed around by other things. So that's why Pluto got kicked out of the planet club and is now considered a dwarf planet. But don't worry, there's quite a few dwarf planets out here. We've got Make, Make, Haumea, Eris, and also we have Ceres in our main asteroid belt, much closer to home. But I want to put away the Kuiper belt and the main asteroid belt because that's just a whole lot to look at. And now, folks, I'm going to be adding on screen some of the many different spacecrafts that we sent out in the 1970s to explore our solar system. So on screen now, we have the trajectories of Pioneer 10, Pioneer 11, Voyager 1, and Voyager 2, and the latest of them all, New Horizons, which did a quick flyby of Pluto in 2015. And we can see that interaction at the very top where Pluto is. And thanks to that flyby, we were able to get some amazing high-definition images of that dwarf planet. So cool stuff. And also to let you know, all these spacecrafts are traveling fast enough to escape our sun's gravity and leave our solar system behind. But even the most distant of these robot adventurers, Voyager 1, has not traveled as far as light travels in a single day. In order for light to travel all the way out to the orbit of Pluto, it takes light about five hours at the speed of light to get this far. So five hours, not too far. But folks, let's leave our planetary system scale behind because now we're going to be heading out into interstellar space the space between the stars. Distance now becomes so immense, it's going to take us over four years at the speed of light just to reach the next star system to us, the Alpha Centauri system. And if my calculations are correct, Alpha Centauri is going to be this star that's closest to us that's moving right over there. We're right in the middle, center of the screen. So four years uh, at the speed of light just to reach the next star system. But that doesn't really put into perspective of how long it would take us to travel there in a rocket ship. Well, if you're getting a rocket ship today, left Earth, it's going to take you about 8,500 years to cross that distance. And that's just a one-way trip. Whew, that's a long road trip. <laughs> But folks, let's stop and consider whether humanity has made its presence known beyond our solar system because now we're going to be stepping inside something called the radiosphere. Whoa, feels like the 80s. <laughs> so we are now inside the radiosphere, and this represents the current limits of the most distant radio signals humanity has ever broadcasted or rather leaked into space. And it extends about 90 light years um, emitting out in all directions from the Earth and this first began in the early 1930s with strong radio waves, early television, radar signal, and then later the detonation of atomic weapons. All this stuff is emitting ele electromagnetic radiation strong enough to escape the Earth's ionosphere. And humans were broadcasting well before that, but the earliest radio was not quite powerful enough to escape the Earth. Since all these signals are electromagnetic, they are traveling at the speed of light, so this is kind of like humanity's electromagnetic footprint in the universe. And of course, the radio sphere is expanding at the rate of one light year per year. So is anybody out there listening? And right now, folks, I'm going to be adding on screen some many different markers. These markers represent some of the many thousands of stars astronomers have discovered over the last 22 years, which has at least one or more planets orbiting around them. 
We call these planets exoplanets, and we're looking for any of them that are Earth-like with conditions suitable for life as we know it. So far to date, we found 5,000 exoplanets just in our nearby vicinity to us. 5,000 exoplanets, planets outside of the solar system. Whew, that's a lot. And that 5,000 number is going to be increasing as the years continue because we have space telescopes where their whole purpose is to find as many exoplanets as possible. In fact, you can see on the right-hand side of the screen, we pointed our space telescopes just in one direction, and they found a whole heap of exoplanets just in that uh, one sliver of our night sky. But to say if any of them are Earth-like with conditions suitable for life as we know it, well, we cannot answer that question quite yet. Pretty much new space telescopes are being created uh, right now, so it's going to be a few years before we can answer that question. But the more important point here is that quite a few of these planetary systems are within that 90 light year limit of our radio sphere and could have potentially received our signals. However, since radio waves travel at the speed of light, if there is anybody that's out there able to listen in and answer back, the communication delays between hellos could be decades in time. Now, to give you an example, let's say we live in a star system on the far left side of the screen. We find an alien civilization somewhere towards the middle. Let's say that's 60 light years between us. We shoot them a text message. We say, hi, we're over here. Takes 60 years to get to them. They listen in, answer back another 60 years. That is a 120 year conversation in the making. Whew. And I can barely wait for a text message from my friend. <laughs> but folks, I'm gonna put away our exoplanet markers because that's just a, a lot on screen as well. And I want to leave our radio sphere on screen because as huge as humanity's electromagnetic footprint is, it is nothing compared to our Milky Way galaxy. So keep your eyes on that radio sphere. Alrighty, folks, we are now looking down at our Milky Way galaxy, and can anybody see their house from here? <laughs> Just kidding. And we're looking down on the Milky Way galaxy, and our galaxy is incredibly large, folks. If you wanted to cross it from one side to the other, it's going to take you about 130,000 years at the speed of light just to cross our Milky Way galaxy. And what's also really cool is that our Milky Way galaxy is so huge, we estimate that there's at least 300 billion stars in our galaxy alone. If our recent discovery of so many exoplanets just within our small neighborhood within this vast star city is any indication, there could be potentially billions of planets and potentially millions of Earth-like planets throughout our single galaxy. Whoa. And before we leave our Milky Way galaxy, I want to show you it from a sideways perspective. When you look up in the night sky, you probably hear people say, oh, look, it's the Milky Way. You can see the Milky Way up in the night sky. When... when they're talking about the Milky Way, this is what you're seeing. You're seeing the galactic plane. So that's the Milky Way that you're seeing in the night sky. And when astronomers and scientists want to learn about the universe, it's so much more easier for them to point their telescopes um, galactically north and galactically south. Instead of looking through the plane of the Milky Way, which has uh, planets, stars, gas, debris, nebula, black holes, things that block their view of the universe. So keep that in mind. We like to point our telescopes galactically north and galactically south. That's going to come important later on in the show. But folks, the Milky Way galaxy is only one of hundreds of billions of galaxies that comprise the known universe. So in this giant leap, we're now going to see a view where every single point of light no longer represents a star, but rather the location of an individual galaxy. Each galaxy containing hundreds of billions, perhaps trillions of stars. And we live in a local galaxy group, which contains about 30 galaxies, large and small. Also includes the nearest large spiral to us, the Andromeda galaxy, only 2 million, million light years away, just next door, and heading right for us. We're going to get to know it pretty intimately in about 5 billion years, so mark your calendars. And as we continue zooming out, folks, you're now going to realize that the universe is not evenly distributed throughout space, or galaxies are not evenly distributed out through space. Instead, galaxies like to clump together in large groups and clusters, or they like to avoid, or avoid each other and have very few galaxies or voids where there's no galaxies at all. So we can see a nice galaxy cluster right over here. We can see a galaxy cluster down over here. We can see very few galaxies over here on the top left or voids. So you can kind of think of galaxies like people. They like to hang out together or they like to avoid each other. And folks, we've zoomed so far out now that the picture that we're looking at represents the closest 30,000 galaxies uh, in a space over 300 million light years across. We've got to give thanks to an amazing astronomer by the name of Dr. Brent Tolley, who worked at the University of Hawaii who created this amazing map 
thanks to the work of dozens of other astronomers working aside, uh, alongside him over decades of time. So big shout out to Dr. Brent Tully. I love flying through this galactic map. But folks, we now have automated systems that are mapping even the most distant galaxies. So now we're about to see the large scale structure of the universe. And remember folks, every single point of light that you're seeing, that's not a star, that's an individual galaxy. Whew, I feel small. And uh, also folks, just a heads up, the large scale structure of the universe is not shaped like a bow tie or a butterfly. Remember when I mentioned that we live in a flat spiral disk of the Milky Way galaxy? Well, if we were to line up our Milky Way galaxy, it would line up just like so right down in the middle. So again, we like to point our telescopes galactically north and galactically south. But astronomers still wanted to make sure that there was galaxies through the plane of our Milky Way. So we can see this nice purple survey right here. You'll notice that they were able to find galaxies, just not as many or not as far as, would as, as well. Pretty much we have to wait for our technology to improve before we can fill in all these uh, gaps that haven't been mapped out yet. So you can kind of think of all this stuff, but in every direction that you look. So it's just a matter of time. We just got to wait for that technology. But let's continue pressing on folks because 30 minutes is just not enough time to talk about the universe. Because now we're going to be coming across these objects at the very edge of the large scale structure of the universe called the quasars. So the quasars are going to be represented with these orange dots at the very edge over here. So those are quasars. We got some quasars down over here. And quasars are short for quasi-stellar radio sources. And these blazing objects are all billions of light years away. So now we're looking so far back in the depth of time and space that the most distant quasars represent the universe at a much earlier age. We're nearing the very beginning of galaxy formation. In other words, with the quasars, we're viewing a sort of awkward, gawky teenage version of the universe. And before there was a teenager, there was a baby. So let's press back to a time before quasars, before planets, stars, and even galaxies began to form, folks. We're about to see the very edge of the observable universe. So here we are at the edge, folks. And what we're looking at is something called the Cosmic Microwave Background Image, or the CMB image for short. Now, all evidence indicates that the universe that we live in is about 13.8 billion years old. And this is data compiled by Planck and other radio telescopes. And the picture that we're looking at is a very baby version of the universe, only 380,000 years after the Big Bang occurred, where space and time began. And what we're looking at is not a typical photo either. Instead, what we're looking at is a temperature density image, where the light echoes of the Big Bang are color-coded, with the lighter areas corresponding to the hottest, least dense regions, and the darker areas, the coolest, densest regions. These fluctuations in temperature and density are extremely, extremely tiny. They vary no more than one part per 100,000. But these small differences eventually gave rise to the large-scale structure of the universe that we saw moments ago, that clumping and clustering of galaxies everywhere. Figuring out just how that happened is one of the larger challenges for cosmological research today. Though our view here is of the outer edge of the known universe, the earliest light visible to us, that radiation actually persists all around us. It permeates the universe, stretching and cooling as the universe expands over billions of years of time. But folks, we've traveled as far back as the law of physics can physically allow us, so we only have one direction left to go. That's going to be back home towards planet Earth. So let's find a nice entry point through all these quasars and galaxies. This looks like a good spot. And let's make our return trip back to planet Earth, y'all. And folks, we are crossing the expanse of 13 billion light years, and we present you with this view of our universe and the latest in cosmological and astronomical information. We're covering eons and observing objects billions of light years apart. Now, we live in a golden age of astronomy with new generations of telescopes and spacecrafts that are extending the reaches of our eyes, preparing for the eventual race between the advancement of technology and the accelerating expansion of the universe. With that thought, I want to remind you all that astronomy is for everyone. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to enjoy the beauties and wonders of our universe. All you need is the night sky, and if you can, get away from the lights of our cities and look up. Even a good pair of binoculars makes for a decent first telescope, and there's astronomy clubs all around the world that invite people just like you to look through their telescopes and peer into the great beyond, allowing you to partake in the wonders that our universe has to offer. Now, astronomy as a hobby can offer an endless supply of satisfaction, and I do hope you'll join us, those who dream amongst the stars. 
But it looks like we made our way into our Milky Way galaxy right through that radio sphere. And it looks like we're making our way back to our star system. And now we're going to be passing those spacecrafts that we sent down in the 1970s to explore our solar system. And we're making our trip back to the third rock from the sun, our home world, our pale little blue dot, the only place we humans have ever lived and inhabited. And it looks like we're passing the orbit of the moon, the furthest we've ever sent humans out into space. And as we make our final approach back to planet Earth, folks, this is going to be the end of our Tour of the Universe show. And I want to thank you all for stopping by and watching it with me today. I hope you did enjoy it. But with that being said, we're back home safe and sound, and that's all for today, folks. Thanks for stopping by.